You want to get the right things done for your security program. Sounds simple. But what are the right things for you? What does done mean? And how are you going to get there? Rapid7 realizes more than anyone how hard this can be. While Rapid7's Insight platform offers you industry-leading vulnerability management and detection and response solutions, their focus is on understanding where you are so that they can help you get where you're going. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Rapid7 to get started. Data protection is a top priority with today's work from home workforce. However, current data loss prevention tools inadequately protect data in cloud or SaaS offerings from insider threats. Secure Circle automatically protects data as it leaves SaaS services such as GitHub, AWS, and Salesforce. The protection is transparent to users and works with any application to persistently protect data, even source code. Secure your data with Secure Circle Zero Trust Data Protection. Begin your 30-day free trial by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash secure circle. Welcome back, everyone, to Security Weekly's Virtual Hacker Summer Camp. I am Paul Asadorian, excited to talk about how to effectively protect your users against ransomware and zero-day exploits. Here with me to talk about that is Danny Jenkins, the CEO of ThreatLocker. Danny, welcome. Thank you, Paul, for having me. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Danny and I met at RSA. Um, and I was intrigued with your approach to the problem, right? And you're really hitting on a theme that I've been talking about this week, which is, you know, if your security revolves around regular expressions and blocking stuff with whitelists and blacklists, like you're, you're having a tough time. And I'm always on the lookout for new technologies that get away from that filtering, blocking, and regular expressions. And, and Danny, I think you've built something uh, spectacular that uh, is definitely in my wheelhouse, right? Yeah. So, uh, I, I mean, the thing is, is on one side of the security spectrum, we're, we're looking for threats. We're looking for things that are suspicious or acting badly. But and it does a decent job in that it, it does reduce our, our risk. But the problem is equally, it keeps failing. And every year we see another hack, a new piece of malware, a new piece of ransomware, a new type of attack. Uh, and then there's the other side where you're talking about policy-driven stuff, where you're talking about absolutes. We're talking about blocking everything by default and uh, and controlling what can run. And the challenge has always been there is the management overhead on it. Is how yeah. do you how do you deal with that? How do you how do you deal with the fact that when you have an absolute like I'm going to block everything that isn't trusted, and then an update gets released or a, a, a DLL gets recompiled, and that's really where ThreatLocker has, has really shined. In that we've we've taken away from this guesswork of saying, "Well, I'm going to allow everything in the Windows folder, or I'm going to allow everything signed by Microsoft," and, and we, we 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 take a whitelisting approach and then a ring fencing approach. But instead of just saying we're going to block all, uh, we'll get, we say we're going to block all, and then you choose what you want, which will help you learn. So you can say, okay, these are the apps we found and we're going to match them with known apps. So when those vendors release updates, we're going to update those definitions. So instead of having an essential, a blacklist definition, uh, we have a definition for Office and a definition for Zoom and a definition for two or 300 other apps. And you just choose which ones you want. And then we take care of all the hard stuff for you in that we've got all all the lists of those files and those hashes in them for you. So ThreatLocker is helping me define known good basically, right, at a very, very high level. Yeah, and I like to call it no needed <laughs> yeah, because okay. there is no – the line between good and bad is mm. too hard nowadays. And if, if you take something like LogMeIn, it's a, it's a legitimate application. It's a, it's a proper company. They're not malware, but it's often weaponized and used against you. So if we say you choose what you want and we help you define what it is. So this is LogMeIn. We're not here to say whether you should or shouldn't run it on – but if you need it in your environment, then allow it to run because that will that will essentially has a business benefit versus if you don't need Office or you don't need LogMeIn, don't let it run and then it can't be weaponized and used against you. And if the runtime signature of that application changes, that's something that you monitor, correct? Yes. So, uh, and for, for the bulk of the stuff, uh, everything from Windows updates to log me in to team viewer uh, we monitor that continuously so we, we have a lot of partnerships with a lot of companies but we also have manual uh, monitoring and then automatic monitoring so if google releases a new version of chrome we have processes that go off and say oh okay google released a new version of chrome here's 40 new hashes 
that are required to run Chrome successfully. And then we'll download them, we'll add them to those definitions. So you say, I've got a policy to allow Chrome, it's still going to be allowed. And then we get into what that application can do as well. Because if you take something like, say, Angry Birds or Zoom, I mean, Zoom's a perfect example. Mm. Uh, that's allowed to run and we know what files are required to run that. And if you look over the last four months, Zoom has released so many updates because of vulnerabilities. Mm. Uh, it, it's, it's a constant, if you're taking that default deny approach, it's a constant challenge to find out what is what is the new update. But we take care of that for you. But we also tell you suggested policies on, okay, well, Zoom shouldn't be able to run PowerShell. Zoom shouldn't be able to access your files on your network shares. Right. So if we if by putting those policies in place, you essentially reduce the risk of something being weaponized even when it is allowed to run because you say this can do this and this and it needs to stay in this lane. Yeah, and, and uh, so that takes care of process injection, right, which is still pretty common. Processes start injecting into each other that don't normally do that or aren't part of, uh, you know, the no needed functionality. That's something that you can prevent. Yes, because you, first you want to stop things being able to access other apps, so it, so it can't inject into the other app. But then you also want to stop it doing more than it needs to. So, And process injection comes up relatively frequently but more frequently in the ransomware world is not necessarily even process injection but someone running a powershell commandlet or running a regserve command to go out to the internet and run code in memory uh from directly from a github repository or something and if you if you stop these applications going out to the internet or at least going out to the internet except your trusted sites and stop them accessing your files it it i say it doesn't matter when it's been compromised the impact of it being compromised is less likely to affect your business in a negative way. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, the, the first thing is don't let it run. And then if it is allowed to run, control what it can do, uh, control how it interacts with other applications, control what it can do uh, when it interacts with those, app, uh, w w when it wants to access your file. So if it does get compromised, uh, like we saw Internet Explorer last year compromised, where you could run PowerShell commands from Internet Explorer, it can't call PowerShell or PowerShell can't access your files. So it kind of makes it like a dud weapon. Mm, right, right. So you, it's almost like a sandbox for the application, but more in a policy sense. Yeah, it's it's more of a, 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 a granular sandbox for the mm. application. So first of all, don't let it run, and then it doesn't need to be sandboxed because if it's not running, it can't do any harm. The second thing is once it is running, control what it can do. So almost sandbox it, but you can't just simply say, I'm going to sandbox Office because right. Office needs to access your data. You can't sandbox QuickBooks because QuickBooks needs to access your files or or Zoom because you it needs to do certain things. It needs to go to certain websites on the internet. But if you can do it at a policy level where you say Zoom can access Zoom.us, Zoom can access this file and this file, and Zoom can access this and nothing else. And Zoom can't write to the System32 folder. Yeah, it can't write to the System32 mm -hmm. folder. And it's funny you mentioned that, because that's obviously comes up a lot in the security world. Now, Zoom shouldn't be able to write to the System32 folder anyway, because it shouldn't be elevated. That doesn't mean it isn't. Mm -hmm. But it, you can actually say Zoom can't access my network shares, which is a far bigger concern, because yeah. if someone compromises my System32 folder, they can maybe put new software in it and they can they can modify files which is bad but if someone compromises my network data my network shares my documents folder that's my data you're talking about you can whether it's encryption or whether it's theft you you've got my data and you you, you don't have to be an administrator you don't have to be a, a local admin to run a piece of malware that can essentially copy all of your data and harvest it out to the web or to encrypt all of your files on a network share right right yeah, and those are important controls, uh, you know, for a lot of reasons. Obviously, Zoom is a very well-connected application, right, and very popular today in, in, in that. So you want to restrict, and it doesn't need access to your data necessarily, right, in so no. many different cases. Um, the writing to System32 actually squashes a local uh, privilege escalation, a whole class of bugs that we talked about in a previous segment, which is why I brought it up. So now we can chain these together, and you can use Danny's Threat Locker product to accomplish the mitigation that we talked about in a previous segment, which is awesome. Thank you. Um, and so what are some of the other uh, use cases, Danny? Uh, like, d describe to me how someone has... Uh, you know, protected an application that may have caused them trouble uh, in the past. Obviously, users need to use applications, so let's run with that example that we're not just saying you can't run XYZ application. I want a user to run it, but how have they configured it to uh, so, solve problems? So, 
so my background's in enterprise IT, where we attempt and quite often use these whitelist types approach. And what often happens is you you end up opening up entire folders because it's too complex or, or yeah. make these really wide open rules with regular expressions or sort of whatever it may be yep. because, because it's too complicated. So the, the traditional use case of whitelisting is you just deny everything. And, and that works very well traditionally on ATM machines and medical devices that never change, but it right. doesn't work on a, an, a desktop PC. So the, the first use case really is for that locker is we want to stop people running things they shouldn't do. We don't want users to run executables or DLLs or script files that aren't permitted by the organization. There's no business benefit, therefore we want to block it. The challenge has always been the update element, but also when they do want it, how difficult is it to approve? So if you think mm. about traditional whitelisting, you say, okay, nothing's allowed to run. I go to join a call and it needs Zoom and I don't have a policy to allow Zoom. And I can request permission and the administrator, and even on some of the most advanced, you see request permission, it says the administrator, Dan has requested access to zoom.exe. So they say, okay, I'm going to approve that. And and we do all that in seconds. But the challenge then is, well, what happens to the 104 dependencies that Zoom needs? Right. And they're not approved. So, so and that's where we've really, if you see the typical threat locker use case, because we have all these built-in definitions, and then we have these learning modes and different functions like that as well, you can just say, okay, request permission, threat locker knows what this is. We recognize this. This matches our definition for zoom use our definition we'll capture we've got all the dependencies already captured we know what they are you allow it we're going to put the policies in place that are accurate for you and then we're going to we're going to use the ring fencing policy to make sure it can't do more than it's supposed to do um so what we see at most companies that use threat locker doing is they 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 really take this approach that we want to control what runs in our environment not just at the user level but also at the kernel level so if someone exploits mm -hmm. something at the kernel or pushes it out through group policy active directory or sccm or connectwise automate or whatever it may be it doesn't matter because we're going to block it at the kernel level and then when you want to approve new software the security team or the it team says yes i want to approve that it's very simple it takes 15 seconds um and but we're going to control approve it with these parameters around it. The other big use case we see is the ability to create policies to track and control access to storage. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately a lot of threat, a lot of ransomware comes in the, in the form of storage. And storage could be a USB drive. It could be as simple as you can't use USB drives that aren't encrypted. But it could also be a network share or a backup folder. So you can say, I have a backup folder here and it's running, it hosts my Veeam backup on my my backup software i only want veeam to be able to write to that folder or even access that folder so it's not so you're controlling that access not just at a user level but at an application level so a user or an administrator can't inadvertently run something that's going to access that folder as a separate policy and we see what we see most companies do is start off by denying everything that's not trusted it is very very simple i mean if you've ever used the, the traditional whitelisting you'll you'll appreciate when you see threat locker how quick this is and we've done 2000 user deployments in an hour an hour call for a demo and deployment and then an hour and a half call later on to do a review of the audit and lock it down so that's how simple it is um lock it down don't let anything run and then when something does run only allow that software to access what it needs to and then f back that up with additional storage policies and things like that, where you can block access to writing to certain folders, whether they're network folders or System32 or whatever it may be. Yeah, have, having been on both offense and defensive side, uh, I totally see where you've made my job easier as a defender, right? Because I, I ran into the situation the other day, right? I was trying to whitelist a, a website, but you know, it's got a multiple domains that it's accessing that are all associated with this chat application. So I had to manually go, you know, on block and, and figure it out. So you've taken away that level of administration, made it easier for me. From an attacker's perspective, you've made it very, very difficult for me to do anything, even if I do get on, on the system and raise the bar. And that's really it. It's not about looking for every potential attack surface because mm. there are a lot of companies out there I mean, you're at RSA, I was at RSA, and you, you walk from booth to booth to booth, and everybody tells you, we've got the best detection, we detect all the threats. Well, if that was true, there wouldn't be any ransomware, right. and there wouldn't be any threats, and, and you can't detect all the threats. And that's not to say that threat detection isn't important, but you don't put three house alarms on your house with motion sensors and glass breaking sensors and, and contact sensors, and 
not lock your front door because somebody can still walk in and take the TV off the wall. It's going to make a lot of noise, but they're still mm. going to do that. So you've got to have a control element and you've got to make it really hard from an attacker's point of view uh, that there's less surface area, there's less places they can attack, there's less ways they can get into your system. And the less ways they have to get into your system, the less likely they are going to do that. Uh, and then you're not hoping, you know, going to bed at night, hoping that your antivirus is going to detect the latest piece of ransomware. Right. Danny, great stuff for folks that want to learn more and get a demo. You can go to securityweekly.com forward slash threat locker. Danny, thank you so much for appearing on Security Weekly. Thank you, Paul, for having me. Without taking a short break, come back with some more interviews. Stay tuned. Welcome to Security Weekly's Virtual Hacker Summer Camp 2020. I am your host, Matt Alderman. Yes, I am here today. Paul had the first few segments. I get the next few. Joining me for this interview segment is Stephen Boyer. He's co-founder and chief technology officer at BitSight. Stephen, welcome to Security Weekly. Hey, Matt. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. So we're going to talk about remote work, but you guys did a survey. What I thought was interesting is you surveyed like 41,000 companies or something like that. I mean, your sample size is just gigantic. Can you just give us an overview of some of the interesting findings out of that survey results? Because I think it sets up some of the challenges organizations are going to face or are already facing. And then we can get into some of the nuances about what BitSight's doing about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it uh, wasn't a survey so much as an analysis that we did where we were able to tie uh, home configurations or what we call work from home remote offices to corporations. And so we're going to say, okay, this particular employee is connecting them from this IP address uh, and they're associated with this corporation. So what are the configurations on the home? Uh, and so we spend a lot of time measuring the performance and exposure of organizations. Uh, but what's been so different here uh, with COVID is that most everyone is working at home. And so our question was, well, what does the configuration state look like? What does the performance look like on these remote offices, which is basically all the remote employees? And so we looked at a couple different aspects. We looked at, well, what are the services and vulnerabilities exposed externally at home? Uh, and then what kind of malware do we see coming out of the home? Uh, and so that's done with active uh, analysis uh, or scanning. And then it's also with a technique called sinkholing to see the malware coming out. And what was fascinating to see uh, is that we were able to tie about 40,000 organizations uh, from their corporate networks to the, to the remote employees. And we're able to see that the probability of having malware at the home uh, was three to four times higher. Uh, as you can imagine, okay, the, the work office has detections and protections, uh, and that the probability of having more than one infection was seven and a half times higher, which is, hey, you might have a random infection at the office, but your probability of having many at home was much higher, uh, seven and a half times higher, and that most of these home uh, networks have one to two services exposed. About a quarter of these remote offices have these uh, services exposed, where one in seven of those uh, services had an administrative interface exposed. Uh, so when you think about the environments that sit in the office, well, they're pretty well managed uh, and monitored. Uh, but when you get to the home, a lot of the bets are off, and a lot of the protections and performance that we would expect to have uh, in the office are very, very different when you get to the house. Yeah, and what we've seen is the attack vectors really staying the same. We're just seeing more of them. We're seeing the volume go mm -hmm. up, and without the same enterprise defenses at home that we have uh, at, at the office, we're seeing the probability of risks going higher, right? I mean, that's, that's what this really boils down to. Yeah, and it, there there have been a lot of studies. You probably you know the the participants and and by the way, thanks for tuning in. It's a great week and great content. Uh, you've probably seen a lot of studies around the volumes of attacks uh, going up. There was an interesting post from NASA who doesn't normally go public around this sort of stuff, uh, but if you go and look, you can see an announcement for from NASA where they were telling their employees, "Hey, we've seen a doubling in the phishing attempts, an exponential increase." in the malware attacks uh, against NASA and its systems and its employees, and then a doubling of the blocking that they've had to do uh, from their employee systems uh, because of whatever outbound attacks or, uh, or other browsing that those employees uh, were doing. And so just about every study is showing that the volume uh, has increased, uh, 
And then you start to combine that with the additional exposure and less protections uh, at the home. And now you've got you know, a recipe for you know something that's certainly going to be more damaging to these companies. Yeah, exactly. So I know BitSight as kind of security ratings. So yes. how does BitSight play into this remote home work environment, right? I, I, what I know of BitSight, and you educated me a little bit as we were preparing for this, but you know, I know you look going out and looking at corporate organizations' yeah. external footprint and putting scores around it. How do you now address this remote work scenario? Yeah, so uh, we do it on the whole internet, right? So we collect on the entire internet uh, regardless of wherever it's coming from. So we have all that. And then once we're going to do ratings on companies, well, then we take that and we map those measurements to the assets of a company. And then we have that history going back nine years. Uh, and so we can see the telemetry on every IP address uh, and domain. Uh, and so the difference here about remote work is historically we've been focused on the assets that the company owns and controls, and that's what has driven the ratings. We just take all those measurements and then you apply it to those assets of a company and look at that over time. That's what constitutes the rating. What's different here is those assets have now exploded. Uh, what was just company-owned IP address space is now dotted all over as some of our customers have 75,000 plus remote offices. So think about it. those are people working from their home, but those are really remote offices. And so you have to take the measurements that you're seeing on those IP addresses, which are mostly uh, internet service provider, residential internet service providers. And so we're looking at all the telemetry internet-wide uh, on all the services and vulnerabilities exposed on those IP addresses. They just happen to be homes. Those are the remote offices. And so we get to see the malware beaconing out. Uh, we get to see it beaconing out of, of companies, uh, but companies typically detect and block it much faster. Where the home, most times the home users don't know what's even happening. Uh, and so we still see it beaconing out uh, of those home users. And so what's changed here is that our customers are now saying, well, we know where our employees are. We know where they've extended the enterprise because they're connecting in uh, over VPN or they're connecting in to use the mail services. And so we know the IP addresses that they're using where they've extended mm -hmm. uh, the corporate enterprise. And now we need to have measurement and telemetry on those uh, networks and, and operations uh, so we can manage that risk. So we take all that same telemetry that we use to rate companies, when we get the assets of where the remote offices are, then we can give very precise uh, measurements uh, and exposure on those remote offices. So how do you get the IP address for these uh, home uh, workplaces, right? I, I yeah. mean, because most lay employees aren't going to know how to look up their public IP address yeah. to hand it to the company. So how are you collecting those IPs to then roll into that overall risk, risk profile to know what which IPs to look for on the public? Internet? Yeah, great, great question. I think everyone's doing it slightly differently. Uh, and so uh, most of the home network is routed through some sort of usually Wi-Fi uh, gateway or out the, the cable modem. Uh, but when you connect into a service, let's say you are, uh, nobody dials in anymore, but let's say you VPN into uh, the corporate network. Well, the time you get to that VPN concentrator, it knows the IP address uh, that you've come from. That oftentimes will get logged in a SIM or log management system like Splunk, uh, and they'll be able to tie that credential, meaning that user and credential to that IP address. Same thing if you're using Office 365. Let's say you don't go through VPN, but then you log into Office 365. Well, that Office 365 application knows the IP address from which you're authenticating. So they can take your username uh, and the IP address, and then they can associate that. So on the back end, our customers collect that information, and then they query our API, or they can and log in through our web interface and say, for these IP addresses, what are the configurations? Oh, great. What, yeah. What, what do we see? What are the exposures? Uh, and then they can be able to respond. And so they can keep that in a very automated way. We also have some folks with endpoints. So where they have endpoints, they are actually running scripts that will connect out uh, to an endpoint to say, hey, what's my externally facing IP address? And then they send that back. Uh, so then they know that they've got uh, something pretty solid that they're doing fairly frequently, like I think about once an hour, uh, just in case the addresses rotate. Mm -hmm. They usually don't add ro rotate that quickly. But it's really interesting to say, hey, they don't always necessarily know what's going on internally to that house, but they know the IP address from which they come because it, it reaches those services and they get that logged right yeah the just the ability to make sure you get those public ips and associate them correctly and then query the data now how yeah. now that they have the data 
and, and you start to understand the risk profile of these remote work offices, I mean, what are companies starting to do about it? I, yeah. I mean, are you seeing some interesting trends of what they're doing to resolve it? Because, I mean, just think about all the potential stuff that's on your home network. <laughs> As an organization, how do you actually guide your remote worker on how to, you know, reduce that risk footprint? So this is a super interesting one to say the price of admission for coming to to this event this week. So this is a really fast growing area that I think everybody's trying to figure out. Imagine that you were in charge of securing three or four office buildings, right? And now you're in charge of securing 75,000 office buildings, right? So it's just a totally different game. The scale is overwhelming. Uh, and so I think everybody is just trying to get a handle on what does exposure look like one, uh, cause that is probably one of the most difficult questions is what does it look like? What are the configurations that we're facing for all of our, uh, employees in their remote offices? And so that first part is just getting visibility. Uh, what are the services that like, for example, it's very, very common. Somebody will open up a port for remote desktop or somebody will open up a port for a, a database. Uh, and while that could be port forwarded in. So uh, just understanding that exposure uh, is pretty key. That's on the external surface. The other side is, hey, for a lot of these folks, they didn't issue corporate desktops. Uh, they didn't issue corporate laptops. People are connecting in from their own personal machines, from grandma's machines, because these things happen so quickly. And so they can't even control the configuration states of those endpoints. So they want to know, what is our exposure from a from a compromise standpoint? Uh, and so it's really a prioritization exercise. And we're going through this with, with our customers now as they're trying to grapple with, hey, I just needed to, I was focused on just our corporate assets. And now I've got 75,000 remote offices. What does this exposure even look like? Uh, what they're starting with is visibility. Uh, okay, where, what does this landscape look like in general? Uh, and then they're actually starting breaking it down by segment, which I think was pretty interesting. Some of the questions we got were, I'm going to start with my executives. Mm. I'm going to just start with the executives where I know they're going to be targeted. Uh, I know that they may not be sophisticated from an IT standpoint. And so I want to monitor what's going on those executives. Some of our customers had some pretty high profile, high profile executives that they thought would be targeted. So they wanted to have visibility in that. And so instead of boiling the ocean, they got visibility into a subset and decided what to do from there. One of the ones that one of our customers is probably the most sophisticated is they've embedded this into their endpoint. So it queries out and then they are auto adjusting policy based on what results come back. Mm. So they're either putting them in a different pool or granting different access to based, based on what they see, which I think is super into. I see that probably where the market continues to go is to say, hey, listen, I have to let them in uh, to get their work done. And maybe I have to allow some Windows 7 uh, in where I normally never would. Uh, but now I'm going to be able to try to meter that uh, access. I may limit access to certain services or put more scrutiny on it. And so they're dialing up and dialing down uh, access privileges based on the mm. information that they see. So all the way from, hey, we just need to get a handle on this so we can report what our exposure looks like uh, and justify additional investment down to operationally auto-triggering uh, access control, which I thought was, was pretty sophisticated. Sounds like a lot of new strategic partnerships coming out of this discussion, right? Because taking your data and integrating it into their solution now allows you to be a little more real-time in addressing the risk uh, as, it's, as it's happening, not kind of after the fact. Yeah, yeah. So we, we are not a, a mitigation solution, I think, nor do we ever plan to be. We really want to work with uh, the folks who are in there making the changes who can can just can justify controls or make control state, and so anyway. And if you're listening, please you know uh, send me a note, Boyer at Bitside.com, and love to to chat with you about how we can integrate. Right now, we're just everybody's scrambling with this one, and so you know we're just giving this to our customers for free so they can get this access. Uh, but over time, what I see is some pretty sophisticated remediation capabilities that are going to have to happen. The reason why this is such a challenge, though, is it's super complex. Uh, and I was just talking with Matt before we got on the air. There was another talk yesterday from the Orange team. Definitely go check it out about what happens uh, when you're remote. And a lot of people think you're okay with VPN. And they showed with a bunch of examples, you're not. Uh, there are so many other vulnerabilities and risks. One of the biggest ones is the home router. 
uh, and that home router is probably one you've probably had for a decade. Uh, you've probably never managed it. You probably have the default credentials on the administrative page. Uh, and a lot of the malware will go after that uh, and try to change the configuration state where as soon as they change DNS, where they can start snooping on traffic uh, and you're not always connected to that or you may not be checking those things, you can be exploited. Uh, and they demonstrate it, which is actually uh, super cool. And so I think what you're going to have is you'll have the spectrum of now we know about the problems, but now we need to actually go do something about the problems. Uh, we very much decided to stay in the the measurement uh, and the risk quantification side of things, uh, but plugging this into SOAR systems, SIM systems, endpoint management, EDR, uh, critical because now you need to be able to, to manage what's going on. I think one of the next big challenges though is uh, what do you do about the teenager's machine that got compromised because he put a new you know, Minecraft mod on there that has a backdoor and then that's starting to do additional stuff or, or the Xbox or the TV that gets compromised. That's a really interesting one. Or how do you walk uh, the administrative assistant through closing down a port on their router? Uh, right, I think that's a whole other area of how you're going to manage, manage this and mitigate this risk and doing it at scale. That's going to require quite a bit of collaboration. Yeah, you get this interesting uh, kind of balance between enterprise, but also kind of like um, consumer, right? Well, that's because it. it, it, it consumer, that's where the worlds have collided. Yeah. Right? They've absolutely collided there. And you're like, normally at at the office, you're behind a Palo Alto, you know, firewall, right? And they're they're doing some sort of access control to even get you on the network. Uh, and and so it's like that's not at all the home, right? And yeah. who knows what Wi-Fi password they set? Uh, but your your extension of your network is almost as just as good as the the access control that they have on that Wi-Fi access point. Yeah, uh, which which is which is makes it super difficult, and then multiply that by the thousands, uh, it just becomes uh, a huge challenge. Yeah, definitely a huge challenge. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us on Security Weekly. Ah, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Love to do it again. Awesome. If anybody wants to get a security snapshot report, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash bitsite. And with that, we'll take a break and come back soon with more interviews on Virtual Hacker Summer Camp.